It's good to be back in Sao Paulo. It's been almost 20 years. Um, in the course of this presentation, we're going to go through three distinct topics. First, we're going to talk about the summary of the first half of this year's threats. Uh, we recently released a report on the one half 2018 threat landscape. And so I have material on that that I'll be sharing with you. And then I've got a couple of charts that will discuss some threats that are active in the region currently, a couple of banking incidents. Uh, and then we'll close the presentation with a discussion of some particular issues involving Internet of Things. Now, Internet of Things goes by many names. First of all, although the phrase is new, the technology is very old. IoT has its roots in programmable logic controllers that were created in the 1960s. The Modbus protocol used by industrial control systems was developed in 1969. So it has a long history and what's happening now is this whole set of operational technology is beginning to run into and cross wires with information technology. And that's causing a series of problems. But that'll be the last part of the talk. So let's begin by looking at what's going on now. Um, the summary for the first half of this year is vulnerabilities for SCADA, that's one of the forms of industrial control systems, uh, increased over the first half of 2017 by nearly a third. People are discovering these and uh, Trend has uh, the uh, custodianship of the Zero Day Initiative, ZDI. Uh, and we accept reports on vulnerabilities that have security implications for IoT, for SCADA, for industrial control systems, for anything in the OT area. Cryptocurrency mining is a huge problem uh, and it's more than doubled since the first half of last year. Uh, people still have systems that are unpatched. Unpatched systems can host crypto mining technology, and so that's going up. Um, mega breaches, breaches where over a million records are lost, uh, those are increasing. And business email compromise is continuing to, uh, to grow. This is where somebody sends an email that looks like it's from your president telling you to send some money to a new customer somewhere. Uh, those things are happening all over the world. For each of these vulnerabilities, we have recommended solutions, things that you can do. So let's, let's dig in. Um, of course, the famous uh, firmware clause. I don't know that a lot of people are actually infected with Spectre or Meltdown or the newer variations of it, but it's a scary problem, and it's the kind of problem that is extremely difficult to detect. Um, if we would like to have a conversation about how it actually works, I can step through that. During my career at IBM, I assisted with the development of the microcode that underlay the processors for the mainframes. Uh, they don't exhibit these vulnerabilities, uh, and we can talk about why. Basically, it has to do with the way the pipeline is flushed when an instruction stream uh, reaches a branch point. But we need to be aware of these, and we need to patch against these things in our uh, Linux and Android and uh, Windows environments. Uh, in terms of vulnerabilities by vendor, uh, Apple saw the greatest increase in the number of reported vulnerabilities. Uh, Foxit, which is a company that competes with Adobe, uh, saw a significant uptick, and Adobe itself, our good friends, Flash, <laughs> Reader, uh, continue to uh, uh, be up there in the pack. Uh, one good thing that we're seeing is the majority of the vulnerabilities get patched within the 60-day window. Uh, Trend and the Zero Day Initiative are responsible in handling and managing uh, reports of problems. Uh, we don't try to get a splash by announcing that there's a defect somewhere until giving the vendor a good 60 days to fix it. Um, this goes into the SCADA uh, a little bit more. The increase from uh, 155 to 202 in the first half of the year was a nice step, a bad step up rather. But the decrease in the number of patches that were available is really good news. It's really good news because it means the vendors of these technologies, 
the vendors of the industrial control system technologies are stepping up and they're providing patches in a reasonable time. Four years ago, some of the largest industrial control systems vendors were letting patches go 200 days or longer. And that's over. So they're really stepping up. They're really getting, uh, uh, getting in line with what we need in, uh, in ICT and, uh, and ICT. So keep systems patched. That's the biggest. If, if there's one thing you remember from this talk, that's it. Keep your systems patched. Keep them current. Don't let existing known problems cause problems for you or your enterprise. So what do we do about them? Patch. Use something to shield yourself against vulnerabilities and maintain compliance. Not because, not because the bad guy, or more likely the bad script, is going to say, oh, we can't attack them. They're compliant. That isn't how it works. <laughs> but if you're compliant, you will have reduced your attack surface. And that's a good thing. You'll cut back on the number of ways in which you can be attacked. So going into cryptocurrency, big increase, and a large increase in the number of families that are doing it. 47 new cryptocurrency mining families. So if your systems are consuming a lot more power than they did, if they seem to be busier than they were before, if your Nest thermostat in your home is warm because it's doing a lot of processing, if your smart TV isn't responsive when you try to change the channel, check to see if there's some other software running on that. It shows up on watches. It shows up on phones. Anywhere people can put this crypto mining malware, they'll do it. And they're, they're not doing it to show off. They're doing it to make money. They're stealing your power. They're stealing your processing in order to make money for themselves. So what do we do about that? They're hard to spot. They leach power. Um, somebody said they can actually cause damage to machines. Uh, a little bit of a hard time with that. A machine that's running all the time shouldn't, just because it's running all the time, burn out. Okay? It's not like an automobile engine where you have to slow it down, where you can over-rev the thing. But you do want to take that stuff out because it's going to get in the way of normal processing. It'll skew your utilization results. It'll make you think you're out of resources when, in fact, you're not. So do we, we look at cryptocurrency. We look at ransomware, allied, a serious problem. Uh, it's not grown as fast. In fact, it's come down a bit uh, in terms of new families. But the old ones are still out there, 380,000 uh, in the first half of this year. A big problem, and these exploit known vulnerabilities. There are no significant ransomware attacks that exploit zero day. There are no ransomware attacks that take advantage of problems that you or we at Trend don't know about. So if you are current with patching, you will not have a problem with ransomware. Looking at where cryptocurrency and ransomware attack uh, we've done a split of the level of incidents by country. Uh, France leads Europe. South Africa has the most in the African continent. In the Americas, uh, U.S. is first, Brazil is second. Um, Asia, Japan is way far out in front, a lot of that activity. Uh, surprisingly, in Asia, Korea doesn't show up very high. But in Oceania, uh, Oce uh, at, um, Australia has a lot of activity there. When we look at ransomware, South Africa again leads. In Europe, France is way down. Ransomware shows up in Romania, unpatched systems. Perhaps not as richly populated with the latest and greatest technology, so it's not quite as attractive as a seedbed for, for crypto mining. You want a fast processor for that. But as a platform that's unpatched and that is controlling critical systems, a likely target. In Asia, ransomware in India, and Vietnam. Vietnam's coming up strong. In the Americas, Brazil has almost as much as the United States. Awful lot of ransomware flying around here. So again, keep tabs in your systems, keep them patched. 
and Australia way out in front in uh, the ocean continent. In terms of data breaches in the US, the numbers continue to go up, mega breaches go up. It gets to the point where you say, well, haven't they already got everybody's everything twice? You know, so how much more is there left? With the Equifax breach, anybody who's ever had a job or gotten a W-2 in the United States pretty much has been breached at some point. Um, the most breached industries, healthcare by far. Why? Um, healthcare has a unique problem in that the hardware that's used in hospitals running IT has to be approved by a regulatory authority. And the regulatory authority, at least in the US, takes seven years to make an approval, right? So when you put a hospital bed out there that's got you know, the latest and greatest certification, I'm looking at my watch, it's 2018, that software was frozen in 2011. And if you change the software configuration on a piece of medical equipment, you lose your certification. What that means is the latest and greatest technology is running Windows 7 or Windows XP and it cannot be patched, which is why you need to segment your networks. You need to make sure that hospital systems are not connected to internet or to other IT systems in your enterprise. They have to be, they have to be isolated. And, and while we're talking about isolation, I've been in IT for a long time. Uh, I never believed in the existence of a perimeter, but if you have a cell phone, that device has a Wi-Fi network, a cellular network, a Bluetooth network, a near-field network, a GPS network, a motion detector, an accelerometer, a camera, and a microphone. That's how many separate networks you carry with you when your cell phone is on. So if you take your cell phone into an environment that is segregated, that is cut off, you have to be very, very careful about what kind of wireless traffic is acceptable in that area. You may want to lock down cell phones. We just had an incident recently where a large manufacturer of semiconductors lost their entire factory floor. And we're talking about tens of thousands of robotic manufacturing devices, which were built by a vendor for this manufacturer, which were frozen and not accessible or updatable with Windows 7. They saw the breach. Contractor had plugged something in that they shouldn't have plugged in to one of these robots. The infection spread across nearly 100,000 machines in 40 seconds. Faster than anybody could do anything. And it only takes one error for that kind of thing to happen. So be very aware of what you're doing when you connect IT with OT systems. Uh, in terms of the causes of unintended disclosure, uh, I modified this chart to make the circles represent the actual percentages. 42% um, the majority of the time, uh, it was, uh, rather the plurality of the time, it was, oops, I forgot to lock down something. I forgot, as Marcus mentioned, to turn off the universal read bit. Hacking or malware is a very close second. Physical loss of device, one out of seven or eight times and other insider attacks and such. That's actually a very small, small percentage of it. It's people making mistakes and hackers exploiting breaches, almost always known breaches. Unintended disclosures, main cause. Last year, they were second to hackers, but it's neck and neck between those two. What do we do? Classify your data. I think I heard that before. Know what an indicator of compromise looks like. Data exfiltration, a system that normally sends a very short message, suddenly starts downloading hundreds of megabytes of information to a server that is not known to the network. Secure your IT supply chain. 
the TJX breach, the target breach, started with an, in, uh, an attack on, on heating, ventilating, and air conditioning contractor, HVAC contractor. Um, patch and update systems regularly. You'll hear that a few more times. And make sure you're complying with regulations because in the course of complying with regulations, you're going to build some best practices into your operation, including best practices like change management, configuration management, release management to stabilize those. And by the way, if you are in a DevOps or an Agile or a Scrum environment, that doesn't mean that you do not do release management or change management. It just means you do it very efficiently. Okay? It's just a matter of accommodating the wider process. You're not abandoning the control in order to get bad software out there quickly. You've just got to make the control a little bit smarter to get in, in there and preserve the integrity of the development production environment. If you're doing DevOps, one good thing you can do is to make sure your development environment has the same set of security controls that your production environment has. That way it's not like unpacking and repacking. When you migrate from development into production, the security context doesn't change, and that means there's no surprises or gotchas or seams or edge conditions which create the kinds of vulnerabilities that hackers will exploit, or the kinds of vulnerabilities where mistakes can more easily be made. Um, we've seen attacks against routers, the VPN filter attack, uh, particularly nasty. Um, we've seen half a million routers in 54 countries infected with VPN filter. For this one, you need to know how to manage your VPN at home, your, your, your cable modem, right? This is, this is for you in working out of your own home, working small offices, home offices, or remote facilities. Figure out how to do configuration management on the Wi-Fi router. Change the password. Lock it down. Uh, Mirari, <laughs> Mirari is a botnet, and it's been used to launch distributed denial of service attacks. Um, we've detected scanning uh, scans, show it in China and in Mexico, and it looks at specific vulnerabilities. Again, in routers, uh, you can find the list of who's been affected by it. Uh, but the bottom line is, where you are deploying Wi-Fi, uh, deploy your configuration management tools with it. They're often overlooked, but they're an amazingly important single point of uh, failure for home networks. So change the default passwords. When there's an update, install it. Segment your networks. This would be if you're using it in a, in a distributed office environment. And <laughs> Tell your manufacturers that you're not going to buy this stuff if it can't be updated. Tell the vendors you're working with that you want them to step up. Now, one of the things that we're beginning to see within Trend, Bruce Schneier uh, reiterated the point in his most recent cryptogram newsletter, is that the question now isn't, are we going to regulate or not regulate? The question is, are we going to regulate smart or regulate dumb, because waiting for individual vendors to spend the additional money to make their environments more secure is not a winning strategy for us. So it's going to take governmental action of some kind. We've already seen bills introduced, State of California just had one that says there's got to be passwords. Yay! <laughs> At least they didn't say they have to be 16 characters, upper lower case with special characters in them, but have to be passwords. Um, and in terms of file-based, uh, small files and fileless malware uh, still out there. Malicious macros are back. Macro attacks have come back. Um, and the countries with most malware detection, France leads Europe, South Africa leads Africa. Uh, in Asia, it's Japan number one and Taiwan two. In the Americas, U.S. far out in front, Brazil second. What do you do about malware? Use endpoint controls. Endpoint protection, detection radiation at the end. Use layered protection across the environment. Pre-execution, runtime, post-execution, detect indicators of compromise. If somebody tries to exfiltrate data to an unfamiliar server, you can lock that down. You can stop that. Business email compromise, we predicted it would hit $9 billion. It hit over 12. Uh, huge and growing problem. 
number of recorded attempts is up from 6,500 to 6,800. Quickly, that would be about a 5% increase. Um, in order to do business email compromise, all you need to know is what's the name of the CFO and what's the email address of the CEO look like. We see a world in a couple of years where the bad guys will use AI to craft emails that look more like what your CEO would write, making it more difficult for a person to determine if, in fact, that's, that's legitimate or not. Here, the idea is simply, if you're not sure, if you get a weird request, gee, you know, no executive ever asked me to send $50,000 to Belarus before. I wonder what that's about. It's okay to ask. It's okay to ring somebody up and say, is this, is this legit? You get an email from a supplier you've done business with for years and they say, ah, we just moved to a new bank, please update our accounts to transfer payments to this account at this bank, don't use that old account at that bank. And it works. People say, oh, okay. And they send the money to the, to the bad guys for a couple of months until finally the real vendor calls up and says, where's our payments? I thought you liked us. So you raise uh, awareness about it, tell people how they look, how they work, verify the legitimacy of fund transfer requests, and make sure that your supply requests are coming from who they should be coming from. Who is allowed to tell you what bank a vendor is used? Is using? Where do we see the most email threats blocked? Interestingly, Tunisia comes close to South Africa, and Europe, France, Leeds, Germany is close. In Asia, China, Vietnam. In the Americas, US, Brazil, and Australia. The most business email compromise attacks, Australia, which, which makes sense when you realize that that country is very thinly populated. They don't have a whole lot of people. So the depth of trust between folks who are far apart is very high. There's a, there's a lot of, I expect, you to behave in this way, and I expect, I know you expect me to behave in this way. And it's an impediment, and the bad guys are taking advantage of it. Recently, uh, Bankamex was hit by SWIFT. We're now into the second area, looking at a couple of problems that have happened in Latin America. And Banco de Chile was uh, hit with some pretty nasty malware. It uh, was a double-barreled attack. The first part of the attack was uh, kill disk, which is a really old piece of malware, what it did was it disabled 9,000 workstations and 500 servers to distract the IT organization. And while they were trying to put out all those fires, there were some swift transactions that were for a total t uh, $10 million uh, that actually went through. Now, they, I believe they got most of the money back. In the case of Bancomex, they were fortunate because the transactions took place very early in the morning and didn't actually clear before the uh, IT organization was able to see where the money had gone. They were able to put a halt to it. SPY, uh, this was an attack on the domestic payment system in Mexico. Uh, a, series of, um, a series of, an unfortunate series of events uh, that took a place across uh, about a month. Uh, looks like 18 to 20 million was, was stolen. Um, for all of these attacks, I have the references at the end of the talk, which is available to anyone who would like a copy. So that's the first two parts. Now in the last 10 or so minutes, I'm going to talk about the industri excuse me, excuse me, industrial IoT area. So we're going to start with the baseline, what is Internet of Things? I'm going to broaden the definition to go back to the 1960s, it's any kind of network sensors, analytical engines, sequential logic controllers, what we called them back in the 60s and 70s. Industrial control systems is the broadest term, or you might hear it referred to as OT, meaning operational technology. Um, and there are many names. I include the name intelligent electronic device because to those of us who've been looking at the news, an IED is something that explodes. Um, and that is an important reminder that the language that 
people use in industrial control systems is different than the language people use in IT. And there are many opportunities for misunderstanding. That's just one. Here's what a typical distributed control system might look like. At the top, you have servers, we'll call them, that process archives. On the top right, you have what we call HMI, Human Machine Interface. Or if you're an IT person, a workstation, a PC. There's an internet backbone of some kind which connects to field devices and field control units. In the middle there, you can see a blue million protocols, extremely proprietary. Modbus, Modbus over TCP, DDE, VSAT, LAN, WAN, radio, micro, all kinds of communications. Some of these protocols are so primitive, they're not much more than Morse code. Dot, dot, dot means speed up the pump. I mean, it's really that simple. And because these devices are small and remote, they are not usually fortified. They don't use any encryption. They don't use any authentication. There's no identity management in there. There's no signature exchange. There's no public key. I've got a wire, and I push this button, and these lights go off. And that's what an industrial control system is like. These devices are made by vendors that use proprietary standards. ABB, the manufacturer used to be known as the CEO Brown Boveri, has over 20 proprietary protocols itself for their family of devices. There is no interoperability. We have some organizations that are putting their protocols on top of TCP. That started happening in the 90s. They, industrial engineers, wanted to take advantage of the best we in IT had done. And so they used TCP IP for networking, and they built their protocols on top of Olay and DCOM version 1. Olay version 1 and DCOM version 1, circa 1995, built into industrial control systems. Those of you who remember what Olay and DCOM were like, probably remember why we stopped using it in around 2000. The problem with industrial control system technology is those devices have an in-service life of 25 to 40 years. So a device that was established, leading edge technology in 1995, is going to be working until the year 2035, running on DCOM version 1 and Olay version 1. That's the challenge. Integrating with information security, I mentioned DevOps. The software development lifecycle is a huge challenge. And when you accelerate it with Agile or Scrum, DevOps, you still need to be aware of what your principles are. Security management, extremely tough to integrate with OT management. And again, I'll shout back to uh, Marcus' point. Information security is a subset of systems and network management. It's not something new and different. It's something that's entirely in there. In fact, most people, once they work in security for more than five or six years, they end up scratching their head and saying, why the heck do we have to do this? Because every problem either comes down to somebody doing the wrong thing or somebody coding the wrong stuff. Anybody who's ever solved a security problem is not going to sit back and say, wow, that was a real question for the ages. Uh-uh. It's usually there's a one where there should have been a zero, and if it's not that, there's a zero that should have been a one. So it's not intellectually challenging. It's just so complex that we tend not to get it right all the time. And one of the big challenges that IT people have when they look at industrial control systems is that actuators, things that move things, are not in scope for information security because processes are not information. Now that's changing. That's changing with the leading edge industrial Internet of Things and current IoT-like cars, self-driving cars. Self-driving cars are a terrific idea, but the software approach of fail fast does not work if you're building a self-driving car. The requirement for quality, the requirement that is paramount for any industrial control system is that the system continue to deliver the service no matter what, 
and that the, inf the service remains safe. You want to fail smoothly, non-disruptively. Those directives are foreign to anybody in IT. People in industrial control system technology do not see reboot as a path, right? We need to reboot this ICS device. It's kind of a long way away. The most remote industrial control systems device right now is the Voyager 1 spacecraft. It's 12 billion miles away. It takes an electromagnetic signal 19 hours to get there. The device has 140,000 instructions per second, less than a quarter meg of storage, and about 200 watts left on its battery. It's been in flight for 41 years. You don't reboot Voyager. If you want to set up a secure network, you want to set up an SSL link, that'll take you five days just to get the information back and forth. Not to mention that it doesn't have enough space or processing power to actually calculate a key. So IT and OT are different kinds of animals. One solution is coming, and I'm, I'm using a chart from ARM, not because we have a special relationship with ARM, just because it was a nice colored graphic and it was easy to talk to. ARM is a manufacturer of chips for operational technology devices. And what you see here is a chip that has two minds. On the left, you have the application running on the real-time operating system doing whatever the OT device is supposed to do. Managing the pump, controlling the flow of water, maintaining the heat in the building. And on the right-hand side, in a secure shell, you have a trusted set of functions, a secure manager, a place to handle and store keys, and a place to safely download over-the-air updates. This is the solution. This was not possible 15 years ago because the amount of processing power, battery life, and network that it would demand was unavailable. It's now available. Moore's law has impacted OT. So this is one good solution. I'll take a look at a couple of case studies. Um, maritime in port is interesting because it's kind of like a microcosm of a smart city. When a container ship pulls into the port, the largest ones in the world have over 20,000 containers. They onload or offload one container a minute. A carrier picks the container up, puts it on a truck for distribution. It picks the container off a truck, puts it into the hold of the ship for transshipment to the next stop or a later stop. With the exception of the person driving the truck, everything else is done automatically. And that's a huge vulnerability. You can get the load unbalanced, you can mess with the GPS and have the ship go in odd directions, or you can disrupt the supply chain, as happened with NotPetya. Substantial disruptions to the, uh, to the maritime shipping trade. Here are the kinds of problems we see. If you put all the heavy stuff on one side of the ship, it'll tip over. If you put the heavy containers on top, they will fall over. The picture on the top right is a little piece of the five mile long line of trucks outside the port of Elizabeth, New Jersey during the weeks that NotPetya was crippling that area. And on the bottom right, you see what happens to a container ship, in this case a cargo ship, when the load is not distributed right. Now this graph is interesting. The blue lines are the safe zone for distribution of weight. The green line is what the software told the captain was going on. A little high in the front, a little low in the back. The red line is what actually was being loaded. The difference between the red and the green line is a hacker. A hacker who messed with the loading system for the ship, causing the problem that you see in the lower right. The ship split in half because there was too much heavy stuff in the middle. Power generation, another area. Used to be generators were wired on site. You would uh, talk to them directly. You would control them pretty much manually. And then industrial control system technology allowed you to do remote networking. But there's a problem. Anybody who's played with generators is going to be familiar with the fact that the grid has a pulse. It's 50 or 60 cycles, goes up to 
plus 117 or plus 240, and then down to minus 174. It does that 50 or 60 times a second. If you're going to connect a generator to the grid, it has to be in sync. My son was an officer on a US Navy ship that was sailing from San Diego to Hawaii. Two days out, they lost a generator. Put it back together, tested it by connecting it to what's called a null bus. A null bus is just load that doesn't actually talk to anything. You do that so you can like rev the engine just to make sure everything's good. The problem was that they didn't actually connect it to a null bus, they actually connected it to a live bus. And when the generator came on, they blew out half the relays in the ship. The port side of the ship had no electrical power. Now, if you've ever served on a Navy ship, you know that it gets really, really hot if you can't move the air around. That attack of desynchronizing the generator is called the Aurora attack. And the vulnerability called black energy which allows people to attack power grids, happens all over. This next chart is a picture of what happened at the largest hydroelectric power plant in Russia about 10 years ago. There are seven people standing around this turbine. What happened was a signal came down the line instructing the turbine to go to 105% of rated output. As a result, the turbine started vibrating and ripped itself out of the floor. That's many, many tons of steel and magnets. 75 people died in this dam. There were a dozen of those. They weren't all disrupted that badly. For the first three hours, Russia thought the US did it. They thought we did it. They thought we had used an Aurora attack to tear up their largest hydroelectric power plant. Turned out we didn't. Turned out they were able to forensically see the signals that their own controllers 300 miles away had sent down the line to cause this to happen. But this is what an Aurora attack looks like. There's a video on CNN and I have the reference for it uh, in the back. So what do we do? This is TREND's proposed reference architecture for integrating IT and OT. You have your IT over there. You have a rigid firewall. You have your OT on the left. Your human machine interface devices are strictly connected to that side. They don't surf the web. They don't talk to operational systems. And the information that has to traverse that has to be understood, defined, and identified before transmission. By adopting an architecture like this, you can help protect hospital systems, smart cities, smart cars. The whole grid. And by the way, the dark energy, black energy vulnerability is in pretty much everybody's power grid. Pretty much everyone's. We have a little bit of time for questions, but I have one last piece of good news. We in IT actually know how to solve this problem. History, Mark Twain said, doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. You see the same themes. When PCs came in in the late 80s, when LANs came in in the early 90s, when the internet had showed up in the mid-late 90s, when Wi-Fi showed up in the late 90s, cloud now. Secure your supply chain. Secure your dev, your dev cycle. Apply patches. Take awareness of what your IoT environment has. Upgrade weaker devices. Support secure architectures for your vendors and prepare for regulatory mandates. They are coming. You may not see them yet, but they will be here. These are the references I mentioned on the various points. Thank you for your time and attention.